ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يدعي الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يؤسى ومن يؤسى ما فلا يضر الا نفسه ما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين أمين رب الشعب صدر ويسر يوم الرحمن Today we'll be discussing the second part of marriage and money. I guess there are less people today for some reason, but that's okay. Um, and uh, what I want to uh, start off discussing uh, are some important things. We'll be discussing three books uh, that have talked about this issue. And we'll be talking about some of these issues, obviously, from an Islamic perspective. Then I have written, uh, actually, a booklet on this issue, called, uh, on the issue of allocating Muslim resources with proper Priorities according to the Quran and Sunnah. This is a booklet I wrote uh, like maybe a year ago. So I'll be reading a part of that. Uh, some of the research here is very interesting. And we'll be discussing one or two other things alongside that with some statistics, inshallah. As far as marriage and money is concerned, as I mentioned last time, the biggest reason for divorce um, is because of money. Uh, the top four reasons of marital or spousal fighting is also because of money. Uh, when couples are fighting uh, every week over money, the, the, the chances of divorce are much higher. Uh, if you're fighting over money two or three times a month, then that's considered almost normal, statistically speaking. But if you're fighting over money like every week, and it's, it's like a, a week to week issue, then it's, uh, it puts a strain on the relationship. A lot of times, uh, also uh, some of the studies uh, have shown that, uh, you know, when we buy things, men and women, uh, men, 36% uh, of the times men will lie about the price when they tell their spouse. And about 40% of the time, wives will lie to the husband about the price of whatever they spend. You know, a lot of times somebody may say something as, oh, it was on sale, or something like that. Um, anyway, so those are some things to consider. Um, a lot of times husband and wife see each other as opponents when it comes to the use of money, instead of working as a team. Uh, <coughs> it is the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, to, and this is, of course, in the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and uh, it is, you can say, further reinforced uh, by the fact that this is exactly what financial advisors would also say, that the wife should have her own account and the husband should have her own account where they have their own spending because sometimes people can become nitpicky, where did you spend this, where did you spend this? But if they have their own spending money, then at least that's their spending money and you don't have to worry about it. And as you know, the Prophet ﷺ said to give your wife nafaqa, uh, like some money in her pocket for spending money for her own purposes in addition to uh, in addition to uh, the uh, expenses of the house and so uh, last time we also discussed the psychological differences in buying or the, the how women view money versus how men view money uh, men are more goal oriented to go to the ball to get exactly what they want for the most part Women are more into the experience of buying, it's the experience of shopping, it's the experience. So when we call, when there's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi uh, Wasallam, uh, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that nifs uh, al-ma'isha, uh, the half of the earning is uh, this, uh, is to have iktisab, is to have, uh, you can say, balance in your uh, spending habits. 
but psychologically that those spending habits would be different for men and those spending habits would be different for women because they're different. And so therefore the spending habits of the so the spend in the spending habits of women uh, in the spending habits of women uh, as, as you know it's the experience of buying and in that uh, 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 the uh, it is so based upon their psychology it would be a little bit different I'll come back to that issue in a little bit but what I do want to start off with something very interesting. And that is this point that's very important for um, families. Uh, one uh, book, there are three books that, there are three, four books, actually four books you can say I'm going to go over. But um, this book is called The Laws of Money and Lessons of Life. Okay. Uh, and uh, I don't like the author uh, too much. Uh, she's very famous. I don't even want to mention her name. But her book has some good points that actually relate back to the Qur'an and Sunnah, as you will see, some of the points are very interesting. Uh, so, some quotations from her books and that I want to share with you that I think are significant are as follows. Uh, Isn't it odd that we treat money as an enemy, yet we always want more of it? Uh, and then she also says, If you don't know who you are, nothing you do with money will ever make you feel right. If you don't know who you are, then no matter what you do with money, you will never feel that right. Because the only way to feel content with money is to actually have a value system on which you will spend that money based upon that value system. That's the only thing that would make you contented. Uh, also, uh, from the abstract of her book, I'm going to read this, it's a very important point. Because like I said, men lie 36% of the time about the price of something they bought when they talk to their wives. And wives lie 40% of the time when they buy something and tell their husbands. So based upon keeping that statistic in mind, she has written something very interesting. The first law, she has a book that has certain laws of, of wealth. And so the first law states that telling the truth creates wealth. Because when you're truthful, you know the real situation. It's very easy to get delusional with money and get into debts and so on and so forth. And so the first law states that telling the truth creates wealth while lies erode it. The most dramatic, obvious examples of this law can be seen in, in corporate scandals in which lies told by unscrupulous executives cause companies to go bankrupt, making thousands of employees and investors suffer. Each of these enormous problems began somewhere in the past with a lie. Beware of small lies that lead you down the wrong path. It is easy to create the impression that you have more money than you actually do. Buying expensive items on credit, leasing a fancy car can make an average person look rich. That appearance, however, is a lie told to impress others. The result can be crippling debt that lasts long after the false impression of an affluence, after the impression of affluence has faded. If you examine a financial situation that makes you unhappy, you will always be able to trace it to a single past point in the past that you had a choice between telling the truth or lying. Something as simple as not paying full credit card balance when it is due is a small lie that grows each month. You must own up to your financial lies so you can tell the truth to yourself and the, your wife or whoever. So this is uh, each decision you make with money puts you at the crossroads between truth and lie. And one thing that's very interesting in this, because I have a lot of things to cover today, but very quickly, one thing that I want to cover very quickly is, and this is, you know, some of these things are cross-disciplinary, and so I will be mentioning these things in different lectures because of their importance, but what is the psychological analysis of a hypocrite? Because one thing that you find in the beginning of Qur'an, from the very beginning, Qur'an says the hypocrites are delusional. وَلَكِنْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ وَلَكِنْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ وَلَكِنْ You know, Allah says they don't know, they don't, you know, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ When it is said to them, don't cause mischief in the world. قَالُوا قَالُوا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْلِحُونَ أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمُ الْمُفْسِدُونَ وَلَكِنْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ So this is about the hypocrites. They don't even perceive it. And really what happens with a hypocrite from a psychological analysis is this. And 
this is how self-delusion uh, overtakes a human being. And that is that we have two voices in our beings. And one of the things that I think, I will give a separate lecture in more detail about this, but just very quickly. For the longest time, psychologists always said human character is fixed. You are the byproduct of your society, you're the byproduct of your parents, your education. You are the, you're a fixed personality. But we know that's not true Quranically, especially Quranically we know that's not true. And we know now that through psychology that's not true because they're, they're, at any given moment there are two voices that you are dealing with. One is the voice of the immediate, like the, uh, the immediate benefit. And one is the voice of the akhirah, the, the voice of the long-term benefit. Khulikal insana ajula. Insan, human has been created in haste, right? Wala tuharrik bihi lisanaka lita'ajala bihi. And then next, bal tuhibbuna ajila wa tazaluna al-akhirah. You love the here and the now. And what happens when somebody who is uh, living up to his values and uh, has a perfect husband, has children, has good everything good in his life and then he ends up cheating on his wife. Why? Because the scale between the immediate benefit and the long-term benefit unbalanced. You see? And what the Sharia does, by the way, is give us rules so you're never in the situation where the immediate benefit outweighs the long-term benefits. The Sharia doesn't allow that to even happen by its rules. And this is one of the benefits of the Sharia. And uh, in the same way, somebody who's made millions of dollars will just ruin all the money in one day of gambling. Right? Because of those, that haste. So, this, uh, so what happened, why am I saying this? Because this haste, a, a munafiq is somebody who wants the immediate benefit and also the long-term benefit. He doesn't want, he, he wants both benefits at the same time. And sometimes you really have to choose. So, lying to yourself leads to believing in your own lies, which then leads to financial ruin. And so, in that sense, money is, your, your whole attitude, your whole value system is decided by money, really. And so, so this, and then uh, another thing that I want to mention is that, you know, there are two, two, two priorities. Number one, uh, and you know, it's interesting how, for example, you will realize this, for example, the Quran says, "Laysa al-birra antu walu wajuha kum kibla al-mashraqi wal-maghrib, walakin al-birra min amana billahi wal-yawm al-akhir wa malaikati wa kutubi wal-kitabi wal-nabiin wa at al-mal ala hubbihi zawi al-qurba wal-yatama wal-masakin wa 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 al-sabili wa sa'ilina wa fir riqab." Now, fir riqab are the people in debt and the people that are slaves. Both this is, you know, somebody caught by his neck. And now, some of the financial analysts are now beginning to say, people that are in debt are like in bondage. Like for example, in her book, credit card debt is bondage. Exactly the same word used in Quran. Credit card debt is bondage, and you will never be able to keep what you have, or create what you deserve if you are in bondage. Because this is what debt does. Debt puts, makes you a slave. And, and see, the thing is, the number one priority of a mu'min should be to get out of debt. The number two priority, and this is some of the hikmah, for example, some of the ulama, like Imam Ghazali says, you should have intimacy with your wife at least once every four days. Why he says this? He goes, because you're allowed to have how many wives? Four. So that would mean you go back to each wife once every four days. So he says this number not only tells you how many women you can marry, but also tells you the amount, average amount, that you should be having intimacy with your wife. In the same way, using the same logic, when they use the idea of zakat, the ulama said, zakat is given on how much savings? How long of a savings do you have to have? One year. One year. So, one is to get out of debt, and the other is that you should work in your marriage to have one years of savings. You should, you should because, uh, you know, of course there are those people that will sacrifice and not be in a situation where uh, there are those people that have sacrificed for the deen and that they can't give zakat. Then there are those people who have, are in the situation they can't give zakat. But the majority of the people should be in the situation where they can give the zakat. And the idea of zakat is you should have one year of savings. 
And uh, so we, everyone should work to first remove their debt, and then second, you have that savings. The third thing that goes with that is spending money in the cause of Allah. This is very important for a family because it creates, like when the husband tells the wife, we're going to spend 10% of our income for the deen, or 15%. What does it do to the mindset of the family member? It sets the values, right? It gives your money purpose. And especially, you know, in cases where the wife is making more money than the husband, then one of the ways to overcome that is to, is to, is to okay, sit down and say, okay, we're going to use this percentage of our money for the deen. So even though if the wife is making more money and the husband's making less money, which I'll talk about in a second, what is the psychological effect of that? Uh, uh, but the... At least then they have a common purpose that, uh, that okay, we're spending our money in this cause. I'll come back to this point in a little bit later. So, uh, one of the primary ways you learn who you are is through your money. How you make it, spend it, share it, save it, open your arms to it, or block its flow. Okay? So this is one of the books. It's called Laws of Money, Lessons of Life. Uh, the other thing that... The other one that I want to share with you very quickly is this book. It's called Your Money or Your Life. I'm just going to read abstracts from here. Beyond depending on, jo on their jobs for income, this is what happened in the world. Beyond depending on their jobs for income, people often derive their sense of self from their occupation. By the way, this is a very big problem also. Because everyone thinks that the occupation they're in it gives them a reason to say others are stupid. For example, computer people think everyone else is stupid because they don't know computers. Others don't know computers. Oh, he's so stupid, he doesn't know computers, right? And then, you know, a lot of times doctors think they know everything. No one else knows anything. <laughs> and then everybody who has a, has a specialty field of specialty, a professor, a professor thinks, oh, professors have big egos too, you know. They think, oh, we know everything. So we live in this world of specialization where specialization causes us to create, instead of having our identities as on something of value, like I'm a slave of Allah, or I'm a human being, we start putting our identities on secondary identities, like I'm this, this is my function in society, and therefore I'm so important, like that. Beyond depending on their jobs for income, many people derive their sense of self from their occupation. Many, for many, work takes over, displacing the time they once spend with their families and and friends and family. Americans typically work more than 40 hours a week, add commuting and job preparation time, and the week has few waking hours left for you to be a human being. Despite long hours on the job, most Americans haven't saved much money. In fact, people now save less and are, are more in debt than ever. This way of living is debilitating, stressful, and hard on your health, relationships, and family. What, you, what are you working so hard to get? Well, usually to get more, you need to uh, usually to get more than you need to have. Consumerism destroys the earth, individual lives, and the peace of your mind. It is knowing what is enough money and material goods to keep you at peak of fulfillment, and just what is access is clutter. What what he's trying to say is that it's very important for each one of us individually to define how much is enough for me, right? how much money is enough for me. You have to like define that because then so you can spend time with your family and so that you can spend time with your loved ones and, and give uh, valuable uh, time in other, other places. And so that's the other thing. So it's very important that when you, so one thing is remove your debt. Second is to have one year of or some savings. Okay. Financial analysts, they say eight months. But I say one year. Why? Because of... <coughs> because of zakat, okay? So, uh, that's obviously, they don't know anything compared to Islam, so. Can I just say one thing? Yes. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to refuse to pray on the deceased if he has some debt, unless that debt is paid. Mm. Yes. Just in fact, it is sunnah to ask when somebody dies, does this person have debt in the uh, area where everyone is gathered? And uh, also, the one year point also comes because there's an eye on the Qur'an that uh, also seems to allude that there should be one year of maintenance for the female after the husband has died and so on and so forth. So Allah uh, We project unto money the capacity to fulfill our fantasies. 
we project onto money, that it can fulfill our desires and fantasies, alter our fears, soothe their pain, and send us soaring to heights. We, moderns, meet most of our needs, wants, and desires through money, or that's what we think. Uh, so, uh, another th so, another thing that I wanted to say, even about spending in the cause of Allah, and this is, like I said, this is a book that I wrote uh, some time ago. It's uh, a book called Allocating Muslim Resources with Proper Priorities According to Quran and Sunnah. This is a book I wrote. I'm going to read to you some research work about spending. And see, when you, when you like, tell your family, we're going to spend 10% of our income for Islamic causes. And by the way, I want to make a distinction here between Islamic causes and Muslim causes. Some orphan, some person in, some person is suffering, giving somebody water. This is all, uh, you can say, sadaqah. It's not fard. It's important to spend on the fard first. Fard is the responsibilities of the ummah. Unfortunately, what is happening right now is that we spend 90 or more, 99% of our resources as Muslims on sadaqah. And maybe 1% on the fara'id that we have as an ummah in terms of doing da'wah for the Islamic movements, for the da'wah work, for uh, creating Islamic schools. Only a very small percentage goes there. Most of it goes to relief work and helping people that are sick and poor. Even in the family, we should have regular giving, regular giving for sadaqah, for giving to the poor. Regular giving every month, $50 to some regular giving. But there should be an annual budget, set budget for causes of Islamic, for Islamic causes. This is for an Islamic cause. And so the wife also knows this is important to my husband. That he will take his hard-earned money or that we as a couple will take our hard-earned money and put 10% of it for the cause of Islam. This creates a certain atmosphere, a certain psychological understanding of, of what you know, and it gives value to the family that we're we are we are contributing to society. This is a human psychological need to feel that you're contributing. And in fact, what I want to mention, giving makes you rich. This is research on this. Now you will be very surprised to read this research. According to new new research, economic growth and charitable giving mutually reinforce each other. Let me read to you. I'm going to go through just parts of it. New economic research uh, shows emerging evidence, crunchy stati statistics from real data, not mushy self-help stuff supports the contention that giving stimulates prosperity for both individuals and nations. Charity, it appears, can really make you rich. Listen, people do, people do give more when they become richer. Research has shown that 10%, a 10% increase in income stimulates giving by 7%. Okay? But people also grow wealthier when they give more. Now, what happens is, like, for example, everyone in the Muslim community like, goes after the doctors for the money. right? So what you'll find is, like, for example, the doctors give a higher percentage of their overall income for Islamic causes, partly because they're expected to. Compared to like another person, let's say another person is giving like a few hundred dollars and maybe a doctor is giving maybe thirty, forty thousand dollars Percentage wise, from total income perspective, a doctor will generally end up giving, what, more than the one who's not making as much. So this is something that should be kept in mind and in fact, this is something that helps at least you know, understand that why Allah made some people rich because they will actually, they, they are the types of personality that will give more. I can imagine some people that are in, in place of Bill Gates and they will not give $40 billion to AIDS, AIDS people, for example. So, there is some hikmah in Allah knows best. Okay? But, people also grow wealthier when they give more. The United States is a remarkably charitable nation. The Giving USA Foundation estimates that Americans donated ne nearly $300 billion in charity in 2006, more than the gross, gross domestic product. The annualized value of goods and services produced within the nation, but all 33 countries, but of all 33 per countries in the world, more than three quarters of this came from private individuals. Additional research suggests that between 65 and 85 percent of Americans give to charities every each year. So this is now I'm just continuing. How does all of this generosity relate to our higher average levels of prosperity? Let's begin with individuals and families. 
The Social Capital Community Benchmark Survey, completed in year 2000, is a survey of 30,000 people in more than 40 communities across the U.S. and is the single best source of data available on civic participation of Americans. The SCCBS, which takes into account differences in education, age, race, religion, and other personal characteristics, shows that people who give charitably make significantly more money than those who don't within the same range of race, education, field, specialty. While that seems like common sense, it turns out that the link in the data between giving and earning is not just way, one way. People do give more when they become richer. Research has shown that a 10% increase in income stimulates giving about 7%, but people also grow wealthier when they give more. Just hold on, let me just finish this up. How do we know this? When two variables like giving and income are interrelated, giving and income are interrelated, economists use something called an instrumental variable to see which is pushing and which is pulling. So which is pushing, which is pulling? Is it that he has more money, therefore he's giving, or is it that he's giving and therefore he has more money? In a nutshell, that means selecting something that's closely related to donations, but not directly to income, like volunteering. Volunteering tends to be money givers and vice versa because of the same charitable impulse. But income doesn't always directly affect volunteering. We start by predicting how much money people would donate based upon how much they volunteer regardless of income. This projection essentially strips out the role of income and in giving. Next, see if the predicted donation level correlates with income. If it does, the correlation is positive. If it means that giving pushes up income and not vice versa. This is precisely is what is found in the SCCBS data. More giving doesn't just correlate with higher income, it causes higher income. And not just a little. Imagine two families, they're identical in size, age, race, education, religion, and politics. The only difference is that this year, the first family gave away $100 more than the second. Based upon the analysis of S CCBS survey, the first family will on average earn $375 more as a result of its generosity. How can this be? It is a statistical anomaly. Well, how can it be? Is because this is the law of Allah. You know, give and you will receive. Or you can call it a statistical anomaly. Okay? While the link between giving and prosperity is not mechanistic phenomenon, while the link is as, as returns on municipal bonds, it goes on and on, but then let me continue with this. The financial advantages of giving are not limited to individual givers. There is also evidence that donation, donations push up income even more at the level of entire nation's economy. We can demonstrate this by looking at average household charity per capita, GDP, as they change over time. Charity and GDP levels have moved together over years, meaning they correlate with one another. Corrected for inflation and population changes, U.S. government show that GDP per person in America has risen over the past 50 years by 150%. At the same time, donated dollars per, per person have risen by 190%. These trends by themselves don't tell us which force is pushing and which is pulling from, and so on and so forth. But there is this phenomenon of pushing and pulling. So one is to give, and this is just to kind of like show you how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this world. That uh, So how these forces, they work. So the point is this, is that first is to get rid of debt. Second is to have a some level of savings, especially in the economy that we live in. And better if you change it all into gold. And uh, this is a, a topic for another time, that uh, when we can talk about survival under a, a complete financial, I think this is a very important topic to talk about one day, what to do in terms of survival when there is a complete collapse as a Muslim community. Because most likely there will be a complete economic collapse not too many decades from now. And we should have a plan starting now uh, for that. The, then, the, So you have zakat, savings. Then the third thing is that you have to have a budget. This is how much we want to spend for the deen. Then 
after that, after you you have feel that okay, this is a reasonable amount based upon our income we're giving to Islamic clauses. Then on top of that, you can now add sadaqah on a monthly basis because that will be monthly. That's not necessarily budgeted. You know that will be like, but even that, just as savings is from zakat is to protect you. Sadaqah is also, or giving for the cause of Allah is also to protect you on the one side. And the other side, it helps the family understand its, its collective role as a family in terms of marriage and, and so on and so forth. Okay? Now, uh, so I discussed this. The third paper I want to discuss, uh, oh, I don't think I finished everything here. Hold on. Consumerism, which means that this idea that the more you consume, the more you will stimulate the economy. If you remember George Bush, uh, he was telling everyone, go to the mall and spend, right? Uh, consumerism is a 20th century invention created at a time when encouraging people to buy more goods was seen as a necessity for a continued economic growth. But that's not true. Okay, I mean, that's the point, is that we shouldn't be in that mentality. Uh, one thing that everybody should do is to look at your past spending, meaning in your life, and basically, uh, getting caught in the race for more stuff is so easy that you don't even notice when you have enough. Uh, how much money ha has come to your life since you first began to work? What have you done with it? Is an important question for you to ask yourself because that will tell you about yourself. It will tell you about your values. Evaluate your expenses in terms of their relationships to your deep beliefs and goals. When you look at your yearly money, where have I spent it? If it's not correlated to your beliefs and goals, if it's not correlated to your goals in life, if it's not correlated to your beliefs in life, then you know you're, you're basically living an unfulfilled life. That's how important money is. And just a few more things. Beyond deepening on their jobs for income, people have often derived their sense of self no, okay, I already read this. Okay, good. I'm going to uh, Now, this is the interesting book. This book is called When Money Isn't Enough. And it's about how women in America, and I want Muslim women to know this, how women in America are leaving corporate America, leaving their vice president, CEO positions, because there has been a very big change in trend in America now. And so this is what this book is about. It's called When Money Isn't Enough. I'm going to read only how women are finding the soul of success. Okay? Despite their stunning achievements, scores of successful women report feeling the same empty, disillusioned, and unfulfilled. Meaning, because you know how women have this monthly thing that we talked about. The, so they felt, you know, maybe I'm not working, that's why I feel this way. So women got up and they went to the workforce only to find out what? That... The workforce didn't take away their, their, their emptiness, you know. The once prevailing mindset that to succeed our careers must take priority over the rest of our lives is quickly and thankfully fading. Today's buzzword is balance. Okay, and I'm saying, I'm reading this so that even the Muslim world realizes what's happening here in America. There is trouble in America's workplace, confirms uh, this um, uh, financial analyst. Profits are up, but people are down. Many people we spoke, many women, this is a research that they're talking about, many women we spoke with suffered from boredom, not burnout, and have decided to look elsewhere for jobs that offer meaningful meaning and, purpo meaning and purpose. These women decided, this research, these women decided they didn't want to be like some of the men around them. Okay. They wanted time with, they wanted time with their children and, and with their husbands. They found that they had been looking for meaning in all the wrong places and became eager to reclaim their individual sense of purpose. No matter what your career, it is purpose, not salary or recognition that gives your work meaning, one psychologist explains. Uh, women became 62% of the U.S. workforce in the 1980s. Okay, that's even higher right now. Uh, but the men, research with men shows that about 30% uh, uh, men are willing to take a one-fifth salary cut 
if it meant more time with their family. 30% of the men are willing to do that. As the United States shifts from an industrial economy to an information-driven economy, the wear and tear of traveling at warp speed got to be too much, especially for women, because it meant away from family and all that. By the time the workforce fam fi finally began to value traditional female skills, collaboration, negotiation, motivation, team building, these are skills that uh, many women were fed up and leaving. This has been seen through the prism of individual lives in this survey. And this book is all about surveying people, interviewing people, why did they leave their very, very high positions in AT&T and Hewlett Packard and all these different companies. Uh, then it says, the biggest change, two-thirds agreed that making money didn't really matter all that much to them. After climbing the ladder and getting there, only to come to the conclusion, two-thirds of them said it didn't matter to them. Some 86 said they would rather make an adequate salary doing a job that makes the world a better place than just learn, earn a lot of money, and so on and so forth. Women reported in other polls that they were optimistic about being able to maintain better careers if that was what they wanted, but it wasn't. A Gallup poll found that one-third of men interviewed would take one-fifth pay, pay cut if it meant their wives could work fewer hours. This dilemma is, uh, you know, and uh, in 1995, poll revealed that many Americans are willingly trading in prosperity in the form of paychecks to the kind of peace of mind having more free time to offer the family. Almost half of those surveys said that their lives were becoming much more centered around relationships, self-fulfillment, and spiritual values. Motherhood appears to have little correlation with the feeling of disillusionment and frustration. So many women are reporting that blew apart the theory that women were leaving to take care of their kids. Meaning there was this thing, oh, women are leaving the workforce to leave their kids. Not true. They're leaving the workforce because they didn't find fulfillment and meaning. And you know how women are. If they don't like something, they just leave it, right? Yeah. So, in terms of pure monetary and lifestyle impact, women who have backtracked tend to agree that sacrifices required were not only surprisingly minimal, but well worth it. Meaning, to leave their careers, it was worth it for them. The trouble with the rat race is that even if you win, you're still a rat. So those are the three books. Uh, I did want to read to you a quote by a Christian priest. Uh, he was one of the Christian philosophers. He said, and this is taken from a quote of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. He's explaining it in which Isa alayhi salatu wasalam gives a sermon. And he says, you know, this money that you collect and you worry about and you worry about the moth or the ant will come and take it away and bite it away and so on and so forth. He said this on that. Uh, Money in truth is one of the most unsatisfying possessions. It takes away some cares, no doubt, but it brings with it quite as many cares as it takes away. There's trouble in getting of it, there's anxiety of keeping of it, there are temptations in the use of it, there's guilt in the abuse of it, there's sorrow in the losing of it, there's perplexity in the disposing of it. So, now, <coughs> just a few more things. Inshallah, we should be done for today. So, talking about money and relationships again, marriage, it's very important that husband and wife don't see each other as opponents, especially in the economy today, that they have to work together. And um, they see each other as partners, not to lie about money, as we talked about that. And then, with the state of the economy, with housing issues, credit problems, and more and more couples are fearing, facing serious marriage issues and money problems, and even bankruptcy. And as you know, money is the number one cause of divorce. Often couples who are arguing about money, it's not money that's the problem itself. Instead, the money fighting are a byproduct of something wrong in the relationship. So when you're fighting a lot about money, it's not really about money, it's really about values. It's really about some other issue, like you bought, overbought something, or they don't agree with you buying with something. But that all ends up with your value system. Or maybe you gave too much to the masjid, for example, if somebody may look at it like that, right? So it's, it's fighting about money, is not really fighting about money. It's about what you thought was good spending, somebody else thought was bad spending because you have different, a different value system. So always, you need to sit down and reevaluate 
and look at it from the Sharia perspective, who's right? You know, is the wife right or the, or the husband is right when, when you're fighting about them? Uh, our relationships, our relationship dynamics and resentments get played out with money. Okay. Uh, uh, says one uh, ther family therapist, it's not uncommon to see a person get mad at his or her spouse and go out and spend something as revenge. This is also something that happens, which, by the way, the Quran forbids uh, those women who protect their husband's property when he's not present. Part of it would be including the fact that she's not spending her husband's money out of anger or rage or out of revenge. Because a lot of us, we spend money just for emotional, you can say, emotional fulfillment. And I've actually seen some sisters, uh, you know, they may be upset for a legitimate reason. I'm not saying why they may or may not be upset. But that one wrong doesn't make it right to do another wrong. And so women will then go buy, use their husband's money to use the credit card to buy a whole furniture uh, set or something like that. This is, you know, not really very acceptable. Um, working through a couple's relationship issues can also solve their financial problems. So it's also the other way. So either either money will tell, if you're fighting over money, it'll tell you about relationship problems or if you fix your relationship problems, it'll fix your money problems. It goes both ways. Uh, another very uh, common problem amongst relationships and money is when the couple are in love, they spend a lot of money, they don't care about debts, they don't care about credit cards, especially you know our new generation, they get married and they just want to make each other happy and be all lovey and dovey and just spend money left and right, only to end up in a lot of debt. And again, this is part of that delusion, self-delusional uh, thing that happens, to, in, especially in the Muslim world. In a significant amount of couples, I see in my practice, this uh, family therapists, are where women make more than men and the women isn't happy. Why? Because the woman feels she's being used because of that. He, she feels used like she's responsible for everything. It gets even more complicated when women, women goes off to work and man stays home as Mr. Mom. Many women aren't happy with this scenario. This is the fact. Okay? Feeling shortchanged in their roles as mothers even though they are succeeding in their careers. Being a businesswoman and wife and mom, then work day is done. Is a heavy load that can create marriage and money problems for everyone involved. It all, it's always hard to be the one that is not earning the most money. It's particularly hard for most men. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, this is one point I think it's just worth saying it. Uh, as a general principle, understand that any action you take in marriage, including an action related to your finances, has an impact on your spouse, whether it's the husband spending and the wife, or the wife spending and the husband. If you're not conscientious of the effect it has on the other person, you're living independently, not married. You need to reconnect. Meaning when you spend money and you don't think how it will affect my wife, or if the wife is spending money and she's not thinking how it will affect my husband, that means that you may be married legally, but you don't have a relationship. And the whole thing about money and relationship is that it takes you, it should be that you're not being self-centered. That you're thinking about the other people in the family, the children in the family. If you remember the hadith that we read about the 11 women, one of them was where he's selfish and doesn't care about what the uh, women get or what the children get. And and the same thing can be said in terms of time. Maybe the husband's leaving the house for some reason for many months or many days where the children are being neglected. And so that's, that's not a fair situation <coughs> to the kids. Um, that's all I have to say for today. Uh, so just as a final point, first thing is to remove your debts, have some savings, have a budget for spending for the cause of Islam. And then sadaqah is always there. When you use somebody needs sadaqah, you're always giving. Wa amma sa'ila fala tanhaq. So if he asks, you don't stop. And money and how you look at money, how you the values you have of money, and how it relates to your relationships. We also talked about that. So inshallah, next time we will uh, continue on another topic. Al-Qulqulihada astaghfirullah wa lakum wa lisa al-Muslimin wa al-Muslimin.